Dear Mojang, hi, it's me. Okay, you know what? Screw that. I've been saying that too much lately. Let's just take a break from the hi, it's me, Austin. Loyal viewers of this show will know that I love Minecraft, specifically that I love hardcore survival mode. Really loyal viewers of the show will know that I have a pet interest in doomsday prepping stuff because there's no better way for me to spend my time than learning how to make a flywheel pump drill for starting fires with friction. That is definitely gonna come in useful in my life, like this noodly body of mine is 100% going to come in handy in the post-apocalypse. But because of these two interests, my love of survival builders and useless post-apocalyptic survival knowledge, weird stuff really stands out to me. Sometimes distractingly. And today, we're gonna talk about one that's bothered me for a long, long time. The Minecraft Furnace. The furnace is something so basic, so rudimentary, so fundamental that you probably don't hardly think about it at all. Yeah. I said it. Don't hardly. Don't at me. Soy City Pride, y'all. Sufjan Stevens wrote a song about us. I can do whatever I want with my grammar. <laughs> Anyway, you build a furnace likely into your first couple minutes of playing, and you never really think twice about it again. But the more you do think about it, the more you look at it and turn it around in your mind and examine it, the stranger and more miraculous it becomes. But enough dilly-dallying, let's get into it. Eight stone arranged in a square. Click and boom, you have a furnace. It has a ton of uses. You can cook food with it, smelt raw materials into ingots, polish stone, and make glass. And it's this last bit, the glass that got the wheels in my head turning. Glass, as you may know, in both Minecraft and real life is made of sand. You take sand, you put it in a bowl, and you heat it up until it's two degrees shy of the center of a hot pocket, it cools, and bam. You got glass. Simple, right? Wrong. So effing wrong. It's so much more complicated than that, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Why am I making a video about the furnace in Minecraft and glass of all things? Let me throw you a number to explain it. 1,600. 1,600 degrees Celsius is the melting temperature of glass. Why is that important? Well, because the melting temperature of iron is 1510 Celsius. Well, that's fine. The furnace isn't made of iron. It's made of rock. Stone. What kind of stone? Eh, it's, you know, it's hard to say for sure. Rock or stone is a fairly vague word we use to describe any, um, rock in the natural world that hasn't been otherwise identified. There's thousands of different types of rocks with different formation conditions and mineral compositions. Bringel 66 on the theorist's subreddit thinks it might be rhyolite uh, because it's an igneous rock given that you can make cobblestone from lava and water and looks really similar. Some others have suggested granite or feldspar or something else but it doesn't really matter much. Why? Because regardless of the exact composition we end up with the same problem we had with iron. The melting point of most regular rocks like this is like 1200 degrees celsius which as you might have noticed is way way colder than the 1600 degrees needed to make glass. Getting a stone furnace up to this temperature is a recipe for a molten puddle of lava. So, is that it? Making glass in Minecraft is impossible. Bada bing, bada boom, slap an excellent thumbnail on it, do a bit of shouting about how trying to make glass would end with the Minecraft protagonist being boiled alive by a stream of liquid hot magma. Well, you've seen how long the video is, so you gotta know it's a bit more complicated than that. Is the Minecraft furnace even freaking possible? Could it possibly make glass without melting into a puddle? Well, the answer may surprise you. It certainly surprised me. So we have a problem. We have a furnace that can at absolute best reach 1200-ish degrees Celsius before undergoing complete material failure, and we gotta melt glass in it. <laughs> Heck, you know, I realize that glass isn't the only problem. Iron is too. Both iron and glass have higher melting temperatures than the material a furnace is made out of. This is grim news. Too grim. Or at least that's what I thought at first, but it turns out that this melting temperature issue is a fixable problem, believe it or not. But in order to understand how it can be fixed, we're going to have to shift our focus. These are the important components in iron and glass. Silicon and oxygen being important for glass, and iron, well, you, you get it. Instead, let's take a look at these pieces of the periodic table. Hydrogen and oxygen, specifically the two elements put together into a pair of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, also known as dihydrogen monoxide, also also sometimes called by its lesser known name, water. Or more specifically, we're gonna be looking at ice. I, I, 
like ice. It keeps my drinks cold and um, actually that's about all I use it for, but it is really good at that one job. To start getting our minds wrapped around this melting problem, let's start it off with a quiz. At what temperature does water freeze? Is it A, 30 degrees Celsius, B, 20 degrees Celsius, C, 10 degrees Celsius, or D, zero degrees Celsius? Did you guess D, zero degrees Celsius? Well, you're wrong! Boom! Roasted! The real answer is E, negative 21 Celsius or negative 6 Fahrenheit. Oh, I, uh, <laughs> I forgot to tell you, it's salt water. Super salty water. Brine, to be more specific, which is water filled with so much salt that it can't hold anymore. I know, it was a trick, and honestly, knowing you guys, there was definitely someone, or multiple someones, down in the comments already writing about the nebulousness of the temperature water freezes at. Salt lowers the melting temperature of water for a strangely interesting combination of reasons. And I know I keep saying if we look at this other thing, it'll help you understand the first thing, but in order to really wrap your head around why salt lowers the melting slash freezing point of water, it helps a lot if you look at super cooled water, which, in a lot of ways, is the opposite of salted water. If you put incredibly pure water, like I'm talking distilled level purity, into a freezer in a smooth container and make sure that it stays very, very still, you can actually cool it to well below zero C and it won't freeze. It'll still be a liquid. And this happens because at room temperature, water is a liquid, meaning there's enough heat energy in the substance to allow the molecules to flow over each other easily. As you cool it, you remove energy and the molecules will be less volatile. They'll be vibrating less and more prone to settling, and when they settle, because of the molecular structure they're in, they'll kind of want to settle into a particular pattern, kind of like how Lego pieces will only really hold together if you connect them the right way. That's how they most want to be when they're solid. This is called crystallization and it's what forms solid ice when it freezes. Water Water is a bit more complicated in that it is not a single crystal, but rather it is a polycrystal made of a bunch of tiny grains of crystals, but that's not really super important to know for our purposes. In short, something moving from a liquid to a solid is crystallizing most of the time. There are probably exceptions that I'm not aware of, but that's fine. Anyway, that is to say its molecules are settling at a lower energy level and they want to settle into a particular shape. However, here's where things get interesting. Water technically will freeze at zero Celsius, but it doesn't have to, and it often won't if it can't start the crystallization process. Crystallization in water in particular really benefits from having a nucleation point. Lots of things can serve as a nucleation point. In normal tap water, it's usually just dissolved minerals in the water. In snowflakes, it's often dust particles that were lifted up by wind. Water that's cold enough will begin to crystallize on the surface of these nucleation points, forming snowflakes, or in the case of our freezers, ice cubes. However, these easy nucleation points don't exist in highly purified water, so you can cool the water to a fairly low temperature without any visible crystal formation taking place, which means it is technically a liquid which can, in theory, freely flow as it wants. If you jostle the bottle at all, however, you can create tiny bubbles either from cavitation or just the air at the top of the bottle mixing in slightly, which will serve as a nucleation point. And that's all the water needs to begin the crystallization process, which it does. And those immediate crystals serve as nucleation points for more crystals to form and on and on it goes, which in practice gives you a bottle of water that freezes in under a second. Awesome. So why did I tell you any of this? Well, because this is how salt interrupts the freezing of water, which almost sounds counterintuitive, right? Like you're adding dissolved solids, which in theory would serve as nucleation points, right? Which, yeah, they do. But they do a lot more than that. Things that counteract this nucleation point effect. Remember how I said that as water loses energy, its molecules slow down? And as they slow down, they want to settle into specific patterns? Well, dissolved salt ions actually interfere with the water molecule's ability to settle into these crystalline shapes by essentially just getting in the way. It's almost like tossing a bunch of pebbles onto your Lego base plate and 
and trying to make Legos stick in place. They just, they can't. It gets a little more complicated when you take into account things like vapor pressure, but the easy way to think of it is that the dissolved salt ions act like goalies, hip checking molecules away from one another and keeping them from settling into a distinct pattern. At some point, water will get cold enough that even salt can't stop it from forming a crystal structure, but in the meantime, it can drop the freezing point of water down to negative six degrees Fahrenheit, which finally, at last, brings us back to the Minecraft furnace. Is there anything we can take from what we learned about how water behaves when it freezes and apply it to iron and glass? Yes, there is. Because while we kept looking at the whole water formula from the liquid to solid angle, it happens the other way around too. If you lower the freezing temperature or the crystallization temperature to be more precise, you also lower the melting temperature. Yes, there's a way to do this with sand and glass and it's called called Flux. Flux is a very uh, broad term in building and material sciences. It's used to describe things that increase fluidity in liquids, stuff that removes impurities from solids, and for our purposes, it also includes things that are added to substances to make them melt at lower temperatures. Glass was probably discovered by accident as a byproduct of forging during the Iron Age. The forging of iron tools and weapons requires its own form of fluxes to make the process easier. Commonly used fluxes in the forging of iron are silica sand, lime, and borax. Which, by the way, I sometimes call borax or borax, which uh, makes my spouse laugh quite a lot. <laughs> borax. Borax. You'll notice that silica sand is or was one of the ingredients used commonly in iron fluxing. Silica, the main component in sand, is what glass is made out of. Specifically, SiO2, silicon dioxide. And it's also the same stuff that makes quartz crystals and dragon glass, also known as obsidian. The only difference between the two is how hot they were when they formed and how quickly they cooled. Glass is just silicon dioxide melted into one blob and then cooled. And this is why glass was often a byproduct of early forging. It would melt and congeal into this nasty, brittle mess that they called slag. It wasn't until years and years after iron forging became commonplace that people really started to look a lot closer at this brittle slag material. Some Something that was considered a total waste product for generations. Remember before when I told you the melting temperature of glass is well above the melting temperature of iron? And what's more, forging often doesn't take place right at the exact liquefaction point of iron. It's frequently, especially in ye olde times, done while it's partially melted, a state where it's malleable and soft, but not really a free-flowing liquid. So how exactly is heat that's not even hot enough to melt iron producing glass? Flux. You see lime, boron, borax, and probably more commonly sodium carbonate were fluxes used alongside iron to remove impurities and increase flow rate. They are also really good fluxes for melting glass. It's incredible, right? Just a total accident, basically. Most of these fluxes can be mined, except for sodium carbonate, which has to be processed from plants that grow by the sea, but how does it work? Well, it works the exact same way salt works on water and ice. Salt and these other fluxes do need to be in solution to work the most effectively, but that doesn't mean that what they're melting has to be a total liquid for them to work. Materials heated to very high temperatures that are also in close proximity do, well, to put it simply, really weird stuff. Sand heated to 1000 or more degrees Celsius will, even if it doesn't liquefy, still have molecules moving a lot faster than they do normally, and occasionally, occasionally, they can change places with nearby molecules, like those that are in the flux. And once the flux is introduced to the nearby material, it will begin to work exactly how salt does on an icy road, breaking down the crystalline structures at their base and making them flow more freely, aka they lower the melting temperature just by being nearby. And as soon as these materials incorporate just a tiny bit of the flux molecules, it works just like super cooled water, but in reverse. The silicon begins to melt and soften and break apart, thereby allowing more flux molecules in, which in turn makes it melt more, and on and on it goes. Fluxes in glass
glass have the added benefit of making glass more dough-like when it melts and less of a free-flowing liquid, which makes it possible to do things like blow glass into shapes and form bottles and vases and bowls. It makes glass easier to handle. So just how low can you get the melting temperature of glass? Well, pretty darn low it turns out. Depending upon the flux you use, you can get it as low as 800 Celsius or even 700 if you have soda and lime on hand. This puts our glass melting temperatures well below the furnace melting temperatures, making the furnace in Minecraft, uh, actually capable of making glass? Somehow? Although there's lots of other factors, like how you even get it up to that temperature to begin with, but honestly, I'm just surprised that it checks out at all. What's more, by using Coke, no, to Tony, not that kind of Coke, Matt, not that kind either, this kind. It's a special fuel. Anyway, using a Coke fire with sodium carbonate and a lot, and I mean a metric butt ton of experience, you can lower the melting point of iron down to 1148 degrees Celsius, which is just shy of the melting temperature of our furnace, making, in theory, the smelting of iron and the formation of glass totally and completely 100% feasible. That said, this is a terrible way to make glass and everything you made would be opaque and gross looking. It'd much more resemble obsidian than transparent quartz due to how quickly it would likely be cooling and the difficulties primitive technologies like these have at keeping materials pure. Your glass would not look like this. It would look a lot more like this. But it is technically possible, although personally, if it were me, I'd be using a clay kiln. Properly fired and cured clay can withstand temperatures up to 2,000 degrees, which is why ceramics to this day are the primary material in things like wood fire ovens. But hey, what do I know? I'm just a guy who sits at home nitpicking video games all day while sitting in his chair. It's not like I could, oh, I don't know, build one of these iron melting furnaces for myself. Or is it? That's right. I spent an entire month of my own time building a blast furnace on the patio of my apartment. And here it is now, melting. No, I'm just kidding. There's no way I'm going to do that. Good episode. Sincerely, Austin. I want to put out a personal thank you to my high-level patrons who make this show possible. Matthew Ridge, John Rozick, Miss Gendra, Ronald Coleman, Alan Hagers, Edit MTP, Nicholas Bollinger, Marissa Resnick, and Loretta Mazur. If you guys make this show possible, I love you so much and have a good one.